So my name is Brett Bymaster. I'm the youth director here at the River. And I just want to welcome everybody on a beautiful Sunday morning. As you can see, we're going to do something a little bit uh, different this morning. So let me tell you what we're doing. Uh, this summer, we're doing a series called uh, The Goodness of God. And as a part of that series this morning, I'm going to be talking about the good and great God as, as creator. And so kind of what got me thinking about this was I heard an interesting statistic recently. Uh, it turns out that San Jose has the highest percentage of engineers in the country, and the Bay Area has the lowest percentage of church attenders in the country. And it's kind of an interesting combination. And I don't, I don't want to say that somehow engineers uh, don't go to church or something, but I think it is the case that uh, it can be hard to resolve faith and technology. It can be hard to be in sort of careers of science and technology and, and carry a strong and vibrant faith. And uh, uh, some of you may know, uh, before I was the youth director here at the River, uh, I was an engineer for 15 years. And so these, these ideas of faith and science um, are something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And so we thought this morning uh, that it would be cool to invite a few students, Christopher Fong. <laughs> and Mei Mei Chang. <laughs> who have their own cheering section on the on the right side over here, uh, to do, oh, and here, I should say, to do an illustrated uh, depiction of my, of my faith journey. So uh, my faith journey starts in Indiana, where I grew up. I grew up in a uh, kind of semi-rural uh, Midwestern town, and uh, <laughs> I, I used to be that nerdy, and I still am, <laughs> just in case you had any questions. So you can see behind me is my family's pool, and then behind that is just a big empty field. My dad was a scientist, but at heart he thought he was a farmer, and so he, he raised cows, and you can kind of see a cow wandering around back there. So as you can tell, there weren't a lot of other kids around, and so when I was a child, I built. I loved to build. I loved to build things in the sandbox, and I loved to build things with Legos. At heart, I was sort of an engineer, even from a young age. Around the corner from my house was a, a small church that my family attended, and this church had a really strong value on the Bible. And so even as a young teenager, I loved to study and read the Bible. And I had this sort of intrinsic feeling that the Bible was really full of truth. And it was something that I had a lot of passion for. At this church, uh, they, they kind of taught that faith was sort of something that you had. You either had faith or you didn't have faith. It was pretty binary. I can remember when I was a child once, my grandfather came to me and said, you know what, Brett, I have never once in my entire life ever doubted God. And my grandfather was a great guy, and I just remember looking at him and thinking, like, wow, like, that has not been my experience, you know? But that's the way I grew up. And so as I entered college, I went to Purdue University. Purdue's a, a, a large land-grant school in Indiana. It's the only public engineering school in Indiana, which is why I went there. 30,000-plus students, very large school. And so I kind of went into college with a sense of faith as either something that you had or, or didn't have. As I started college... Uh, I sort of made the mistake of, I went to church, but I wasn't involved. So I wasn't in a small group. I kind of like punched the church time card, right? Like I warmed the seat. Which guys over here, all of our students, not a good idea. So don't do that. <laughs> but that's a choice that, that I made. So my sophomore year in college, I signed up for a class called the History of Science and Technology. And I was really excited about this class because my two favorite subjects are history and science. And so I thought this class would be like the perfect class for me. I was really excited about taking it. But at the first lecture, as I sat down, I realized quickly that this was going to be a hard class. So the professor from the very first lecture uh, talked a lot about Christianity. Only he would never say Christianity alone. He would always add the suffix myth. So he spent a lot of time talking about Christian myth. He also spent a lot of time talking about the Bible, with, always with the suffix myth. So he talked a lot about the Christian myth and the Bible myth. And as his teacher began to lecture, he began to show, uh, how, to argue that in fact the primary problem with modern society was Christianity. That if just we could sort of shed these old ideas, these old mythical ideas of faith and religion, that we can move on and start to make progress. And he said that, you know, the primary problem with humanity over time has been these Christians that did things like the Crusades and slavery. And he argued that Christians had uh, consistently stood in the way of science and progress. I remember one example particularly. He, he told the story of the vacuum. You guys all know what a vacuum is. It's where you take a container 
uh, full of air, and you just suck out all the air until there's nothing in there. The vacuum is, a, is a, sort of the presence of nothing. And it turns out that the Christians had adopted a Socratean idea, this idea uh, uh, called horror vacui, in Latin for nature abhors a vacuum. And, and uh, uh, Christians had decided that if there was a vacuum, then somehow God wasn't in it. And, and that meant if there was a vacuum, then it sort of disproved God. And so they really stood in the way of, of experimentation and ideas surrounding the vacuum. And it turns out that, in fact, one of the basis of, of scientific understanding is the vacuum. If you don't understand the vacuum, there's all sorts of things about science that you can't understand later on. And so by pre- preventing an understanding and experimentation of the vacuum, Christians in the sort of Middle Ages and Dark Ages really, really stopped the progress of, of science. And this professor pointed at this fact as one of the reasons why we need to move beyond Christianity. That, that idea of a vacuum didn't get broken down until 1628 when a man named Otto van Gerich did an experiment in Germany where he took two half, sh- half shells, put them together, tied a team of horses to each side, sucked all the air out of those two half shells, and the team of horses weren't, were unable to pull them apart because of the power of a vacuum. He let the air back into those two shells, and the shells fell apart. The demonstration was so powerful that everybody had to admit, even the Christians, that a vacuum existed. And from that day on, in 1628, uh, that was sort of, in his, his opinion, the beginning of science. Things could progress once they had gotten over the hump that the Christians had created. And as I sat there and listened to that professor, I began to kind of have an existential faith crisis. Because I had to admit, the guy had some really good points. Sort of my binary faith wasn't good enough to, to deal with this. And I just have this vivid memory of laying in my dorm room bed. And I had figured out that you could write on your walls in the dorm room, and I I had the special solvent I could wash it off with afterwards. And so in big letters above my dorm room wall, I had written in marker Hebrews 11.1, which says that now faith is sure of, the faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And I decided that I was going to have to take one of two paths. I was either going to go down this path of sort of mindless faith, sort of an ignorant path of of believing in something you can't see, um, or I was going to take the path of enlightenment, of science and technology, the path of progress, the path of humanity. And I felt like I was going to have to make a decision, and it was really hard for me because I had spent so much time reading the Bible, and I had noticed people, I had observed people, and I had observed that people who followed uh, the truths of the Bible, that their lives tended to turn out pretty well. I'd also notice that people who didn't follow the truths of the Bible, their lives sort of had a lot of problems. Not as a hard and fast rule, but it seemed as a general truth. And so I had this sense that there was a, a tremendous amount of intrinsic truth in the Bible. But if at the bottom of that truth there's a lie, it's hard to believe. And the reality is that the Bible claims to be the written word of God. It claims to be Uh, sort of uh, the truth of God. And so if at the bottom of all those truths, which I definitely believed was a lie, I decided, you know, that's something that I I can't accept. And so uh, the resolution to my faith crisis came in a really surprising spot. It didn't come in church or in a small group or in a Bible study. Strangely enough, the resolution for my faith crisis came in E311, a junior, a junior electromagnetics class. This class was taught by one of the best professors in the engineering department, a man by the name of Daniel L. Elliott. So this class, E311, is a, probably the toughest class in engineering school. And the, this, this class covers only four equations. These equations called Maxwell's equations. And so Professor Elliott went to teach on that. But in order to understand Maxwell's equations, you need to understand a little bit about the history of, of these four equations. And so we're going to go there. I want to, I want to give you guys sort of a, a window into what happened during this class, which was pretty incredible. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to understand the history of how these equations came to be. So in the, by the 1800s, people had spent a lot of time working with vacuums, and they really understood them well. And they were beginning to understand some pretty basic truths about science. They had re- realized that the Earth was really far away from the sun, about 92 million miles away. And they had realized that between the Earth and the sun is a giant vacuum. 92 million miles of vacuum. And as they had done experimentations on vacuums, they had found that energy in general cannot travel through a vacuum. So for example, sound energy can't travel through a vacuum. If you take, if you take a, a, a vessel of air and you put a bell in it, 
You can hear the bell as long as the vessel's full of air, but if you suck all the air and create a vacuum, you can see the bell moving, but no sound comes out. It also turns out that heat can't travel through a vacuum. So if you take a bowl of soup and you cover it up and you put it in a vacuum, it'll just kind of stay hot indefinitely. Heat energy in the form of convection can't travel through a vacuum. And that created this great mystery of how in the world is it that the sun, which is our source of energy, our source of sustenance and life, uh, of light and comfort, the sun somehow is getting energy 92 million miles through a vacuum. And scientists were wondering, how in the world is that possible? How is that possible that that, that that energy could travel through a vacuum so far? Because they knew if, you know, if the sun stopped shining or if that energy stopped traveling, even for a few days, we would all die. If the sun stopped shining, we'd all be dead within days or weeks. We'd all freeze up and, and die. And so this was sort of the great question of the, of the 19th century. And it turns out that the solution for this problem lied in, in these things called Maxwell's equations, these four great equations. And so I want to I go there. I want to take you there. I want to describe these four equations so that you can understand them. So May May wrote up here Gauss's Law, and I can see right now in some of your eyes that there's like post-traumatic stress syndrome coming from that like <laughs> that freshman calculus class that you didn't pass. So we'll invite you guys to go back in the pr- get uh, math prayer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So don't worry, you don't have to understand the math, the math. don't be stressed out, we'll, we'll walk you through it. So the first of Maxwell's four great equations is called Gauss's Law, and Gauss's Law talks about electric fields. So I want to do a quick demonstration of an electric field. So here I have a uh, 15,000 volt transformer, and I want to show you what this does. So what's happening here is we're creating a giant electric field, an intense electric field at the base of these two copper pipes. And the electric field is so intense that it's tearing electrons out of the air in between the two pipes. And uh, when it does that, it allows the flow of current. And what you see is the light that results from superheated plasma between these two copper pipes. All of this is exactly according to Gauss's law here. So you get a sense of how powerful these laws are. The second of Maxwell's equation is a law called Ampere's Law. And Ampere's Law is interesting because it relates electric current to magnetic fields. You guys have all played with magnets and stuff. And magnets and electricity are seemingly unrelated. But what Ampere's Law says is that in actuality, that current, uh, electric current and magnetic fields are intimately related. We'll show you how that works. So uh, here I have an electromagnet, which is a, a coil with a wire, and we're going to send a current through that wire, and I'll invite Christopher over here. He'll grab this hammer. So we're going to run a very large amount of current through this, and we're going to see if Christopher can pull this hammer off this coil. Ready? (laughs) Try it again. So you can see how powerful these magnetic fields can be. So that's the third of Maxwell's equations. Uh, or I'm sorry, the second of Maxwell's equations. The third of Maxwell's equations is a law called Faraday's Law. And Faraday's Law is interesting because it relates the first two. Faraday's Law connects electric fields and magnetic fields in some pretty surprising ways. So May May has here in her hand a demonstration of Faraday's Law. So what we have here is a light bulb connected to a wire. No power source, no battery, just a raw light bulb and a wire. And Mei Mei is going to do something kind of cool. She's going to make this light bulb turn on, even though it's not connected to anything. <laughs> if she was wearing a pacemaker, she'd be in big trouble right now. <laughs> so how in the world is that possible? Well, here's what we do. Behind Mei Mei behind me, me is a coil that we're running uh, several hundred watts of energy through it at 7 kilohertz. And that coil is transmitting a magnetic field uh, perfectly according to Faraday's law to this ring of wire which is making the light light up. So Mei and I designed this based on the equations from Faraday's law. And you might think that that explains this, this big problem because what you can see is we're actually transmitting energy through free space. And you can transmit this through a vacuum, which seems like it might solve our great problem of how in the world does energy get from the sun to the earth. But as it turns out, it doesn't work for a very far distance. So if maybe it moves that forward just a little bit, the light turns off. And so that can explain how energy gets 92 million miles from the sun to the earth. Now, if you're wondering, uh, you can also use this to charge your phone. (laughs) 
So that's pretty cool. <laughs> and the uh, fourth of Maxwell's equation is an equation that says that there, is, that there are no magnetic monopoles. This one's a little bit complicated, but to get a sense of this, if you've ever taken a ceramic magnet and broken off the north end of the magnet, you'll find that the end that you broke off, as soon as you broke it, stopped being north and ended up changing into a south end of the magnet. This funny, odd principle, perfectly explained by the fourth of Maxwell's equations. If you don't understand that, just trust me. <laughs> so at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, Brett is really nerdy and kind of out to lunch, um, because he, he said that he was going to, like, res these four equations were going to resolve his faith crisis, and solve this great problem of how in the world does energy get from the sun to the earth. And you guys all know how energy gets from the sun to the earth. How does energy travel from the sun to the earth? With light, right? With light. And yet not a single demo we did here, and not a single one of these equations has anything at all to do with light. So how in the world is it possible that this solves this great scientific question, the greatest question in the 19th century? And this is the part when Professor Elliot did the derivation and showed how this worked, it totally blew my mind. And it really did change my life. So here's what happens. It turns out if you put these four equations together, what you find is that light is a mixture of electric fields and magnetic fields. And so what happens is light starts as an electric field, and then a split second later turns to a magnetic field, and then back to an electric field, and then back to a magnetic field. Billions of times a second, switching between electric and magnetic fields. So light really is a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields even though it seemingly doesn't have anything to do with light. So I want you to stop and think about exactly what's going on here. These four equations describe everything that there is to know about light and magnetics and electricity and radio waves. So stop and think. There's light coming out of these stage lights. That light, according to Maxwell's equations, flows from the stage light to my face. Some of that light is absorbed, some of it bounces off, creating colors, perfectly described by these four equations. Those those colors uh, radiate out, spreading out throughout the room, perfectly described by Maxwell's four equations, until you see my face. Stop and feel your cell phone for a second. So inside your cell phone is a battery, and that battery is pushing out electric current, perfectly described by these four equations. That electric current flows into a microprocessor. The microprocessor, according to Maxwell's four equations, switches that current billions of times a second, turning on little tiny light bulbs inside your LCD, that light up, that light flowing out, perfectly following Maxwell's four equations. That light comes to your eyes and you see your Facebook post, your Instagram post, right? Also attached to that microprocessor is an antenna. And that the microprocessor controls that antenna according to Maxwell's four equations. That antenna sends out radio waves that follow Maxwell's four equations to a cell phone tower. The cell phone tower, according to Maxwell's four equations, converts those radio waves into little tiny pulses of light traveling through a fiber optic cable. All of that following these four equations. And when Professor Elliot derived those four equations, and I looked at those, and I thought about what they meant, and I began to reflect on that, I had to ask the question, is it the case that the incredible complexity we see in the world around us can get boiled down to four simple equations, four equations that Christopher and Maymay could write out in, what, maybe 45 seconds? Is that the mark of a universe that happened by accident? The fact that things are so incredibly complex but can be explained so simply with these elegant and beautiful equations. Is that the mark of a, of a, of a universe that's really just an act of randomness? Or is that the mark of a universe that was created by a good God, by a God who wanted us to explore and find him, by a God who loves elegance and simplicity and loves complexity, a God who loves complex things to be boiled down to be organized and ordered and structured in the world of math and physics. And I have to tell you that when I look at Maxwell's equations, when I look at the beauty of physics and math, when I look at the beauty of the way it describes the world around us, it's hard for me to say that that happened by accident. I see in that math the hand of God, the hand of God and the way he's created things around us. And so in that moment, in that moment, I, I, I realized that faith and science for me were getting mixed up. That it wasn't a binary choice, but that faith and science could work together. And faith for me uh, began to be an encouragement to study science. And science began to be an encouragement for my faith. 
And so I chased down this rabbit hole and I was like consuming and, and learning and it was really interesting. And I want to sort of take you down this rabbit hole with me. It's incredible at the grandeur and awesomeness of the universe around us. And it's incredible how you can sort of boil it down to these like elegant and beautiful equations. And so as I began to study, I, I learned uh, more and more about these equations. It's really interesting. It turns out if you put these equations together, they tell you what the speed of light is. These two constants in Ampere's law, the magnetic permeability and uh, permeativity of free space are combined together to create the speed of light. And it turns out that the speed of light's really fast, 186,000 miles per second, 300 million meters per second. Now, what's even more interesting is if you assume that the speed of light is the universal speed limit, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in any frame of reference, and then you do some simple algebra, you come to probably the most famous equation ever. E equals mc squared. Who's heard of E equals mc squared? So that's a really famous, you guys all heard about it, really famous equation uh, uh, derived by Albert Einstein. Well, I don't know if you ever thought about where Albert Einstein got that equation, but it turns out it's a derivative of Maxwell's four equations. And I wonder if you've ever thought about what this equation means, because when I, when I learned what this equation actually means, it blew my mind. It's incredible. So here's what E equals mc squared means. E stands for energy, and M stands for mass, and C squared is the speed of light squared, the speed of light times the speed of light. Now, the speed of light squared is a tremendously large number, a 9 followed with 16 zeros. And so what this equation says is that everything that has mass has energy. And it turns out that because the speed of light squared is such a large number, everything with mass has a lot of energy in it. So let me put this in perspective. This pencil right here, this pencil has this, this two gram pencil. If you plug in two grams into this equation, e equals mc squared, you will find that this pencil has enough energy in it to power our church, heat, electricity, lighting, computers, everything, to power our church for 2,000 years inside of this pencil. Now, that's remarkable because if you set this pencil on fire, you would get a little burst of heat that would power this church for like half a second, right? And yet, what E equals MC squared says is that there is enough intrinsic energy in this pencil to power our church for 2,000 years, which is totally remarkable. Now, it turns out we can't get to that energy. We don't know how to access it because we would have to blast apart every single proton, neutron, electron, and particle inside this pencil to get to that energy, and we can't do that. But it turns out there is a place in the universe where that happens every single day. So I wonder if you've ever thought about this. The sun never stops burning. It's like this giant fire fireball in the sky that doesn't go out, right? And if you've ever had the experience, maybe you've been camping, you built a big bonfire, and it's like this huge inferno. I've done that with some of the boys, right? <laughs> and what happens after a few hours? It goes out, right? It's really hot, and then a few hours later it goes out. Well, I wonder if you've ever wondered how it is that the sun is like this giant bonfire in the sky, but it never goes out. It burns for for, you know, weeks and months and years and thousands of years and millions of years. Well, it turns out the reason that the sun never goes out is because it's able to access the energy in E equals mc squared. The sun is incredibly massive, and because it has this huge mass, it's able to, to, to use the, the power and the energy in E equals mc squared because it's using this awesome thermonuclear, the sun is a, just an incredibly huge, huge thermonuclear explosion. And so I want you to wrap your head around just how much energy there is in the sun. Because I think it'll blow your mind, or it certainly did mine. So, so in order to do that, you need to think about how massive the sun is. So to do that, I want you to stop and think it, uh, for a second about how big the earth is. So maybe you've flown to Japan or Australia, or you've looked at a globe, but stop and think about how far it is to the other side of the earth, okay? So you got that picture in your head? In order to get to the size of the sun, you would need to put together 1.3 million Earths. I mean, it is incredible how big the sun is. Now, you know, they say that you can't understand any number larger than your bank account balance. Um, my bank account balance is not 1.3 million. Uh, if, you're, if yours is, let's talk. Um, <laughs> um, so let me, let me give you an idea of how big 1.3 million is. So let's say that you went down, you, uh, went down to Ping Pong Mart and you ordered 1.3 million ping pong balls, okay? And so Ping Pong Mart delivers 1.3 million ping pong balls to the River Church. They back up their big ping pong truck, and they dump those ping pong balls out in the sanctuary. 1.3 million ping pong balls will cover the sanctuary wall to wall, back to front, 
just about up to the level of your chairs, one foot deep. So that gives you a picture of how, an incredible number. Like, can you imagine 1.3 million earths put together? Now, stop and think about it for a second. If this pencil has enough energy in it to power our church for 2,000 years, stop and think about the incredibly, mind-numbingly huge amount of energy that there is in the sun. 1.3 million earths. I mean, the mass is just absolutely amazing. And so every single day, we get our nourishment, we get our heat, we get our warmth, we get our energy from the sun. This incredibly complex thing, energy is being generated every day, traveling 92 million miles through a perfect vacuum. This incredibly complex thing that's required for us to have life boils down to these five simple equations, these five equations that Christopher Maymay could write down in less than 45 seconds. And you have to ask the question, is that the mark of a, of a, of a universe that happened by accident? Or is that the hand of God? Could it be that that is the mark of a God who created the universe and created it with order and structure so that we could be here to enjoy it and to understand his character and his his divine nature as a result of it? And so I kept going down this rabbit hole. And I mean, it just, like when you learn this stuff, it's absolutely incredible. And I want to take you there. So I want you guys to be able to experience this. Tonight, about an hour after sunset, I want you to go outside and, and look to the east. If you look to the east, you'll see a, uh, uh, the, the summer triangle, three stars in the east, Vega, Altair, and Deneb. The star on the left, Deneb, astronomers tell us is 2,600 light years away. Deneb is a blue-white supergiant, and the size and scale of Deneb is absolutely just incredible. It blows my mind. So if you want to get a picture of how big Deneb is, I want you to imagine again, get that picture of how big the earth is right? The, the, the distance from here to, say, Japan or, or, or Australia. If you wanted to get to the size of the net, check this out. This is unbelievable. You would have to put together 1.6 trillion Earths. I mean, this star is incredibly massive. It's huge. If you want to get a picture of how big 1.6 trillion is, let's say you call it Ping Pong Mart again. <laughs> and you place an order for 1.6 trillion ping pong balls. Okay, Ping Pong Mart will laugh at you, but let's just imagine that that were possible. So Ping Pong Mart comes up with a truck full of 1.6 trillion ping pong balls and dumps them in this room. In order to get to 1.6 trillion ping pong balls, you would have to fill this room back to front, side to side, floor to ceiling, 117,000 times. Does that give you an idea of how incredibly massive this star Deneb is? Okay, now stop and think about it. If there's enough power in this pencil to power this church for 2,000 years, okay, in this two-gram pencil. Stop and think about the incredibly insane, huge amount of energy that's in this star, Deneb, made up of, it's the size of 1.6 trillion Earths. I mean, it blows my mind. It blows my mind the way God has created this incredible universe. The grandeur of God in creation is just, it's absolutely incredible. So I want you to stop and think about this. 2,600 years ago, uh, Deneb was, pu- was pushing out energy according to e equals mc squared at this incredible rate. A little ray of light pulsed out of Deneb. It pulsed out of Deneb just as, as, as the prophet Daniel was getting taken into Babylonian captivity, as the, as the Israelites were moving into Babylonian captivity. And as that ray of light poured out of Deneb, it, it, it hurled out traveling at 186,000 miles per second, 300 million meters per second. That that ray of light was directed directly at Earth. That ray of light perfectly following Maxwell's four equations, hurling through space, day in, day out. That light was hurling through space while, while Nehemiah rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, while the prophets came and went. That, that ray of light hurled through space as the Roman Empire rose and then fell. That ray of light hurled through space as Jesus Christ was born, crucified, and resurrected. It hurled through space, perfectly following Maxwell's four equations, as as the the Middle Ages and the Renaissance passed. Until one day, for the first time in its 2,600-year travel through space, it touched matter. It crashed into the Earth's atmosphere, slowing and refracting just slightly, perfectly according to Maxwell's four equations. That ray of light pierced the Earth's atmosphere, traveling just a split second, 
through the atmosphere until it hit your cornea. Your cornea bent and focused that light perfectly according to Maxwell's four equations until that ray of light hit the rods and the cones in the back of your eye, perfectly following Maxwell's four equations. That ray of light became a little pulse of electricity flowing through your visual, uh, your, uh, your visual neurons coming out of the back of your eye, perfectly following Maxwell's four equations. Until that, that pulse of energy went into your visual processing cortex, uh, becoming and spreading out into billions of tiny pulses of electricity, each of them perfectly following Maxwell's four equations. As your brain processes what it sees, and you begin to get a feeling of the incredible grandeur and beauty of God. As you begin to understand this, this light that's been traveling 2,600 years through a vacuum from this incredibly massive and powerful star just arrive at your eye so that you can experience the grandeur and the awesomeness of God. And you think that whole 2,600-year journey from beginning uh, uh, the creation of power at Deneb, according to equals mc squared, and then traveling according to Maxwell's four equations, that whole process can get boiled down to five simple equations that Christopher Mame wrote in 45 seconds. And I just have to ask myself, is that the mark of a random universe that happened by accident, or is that the hand of God? And I'll tell you that as I pondered that and thought about that, it got more and more difficult for me to not believe in God. It got more and more difficult for me not to believe that we were here on purpose, that we were created, and this universe was created for us to inhabit it. It's interesting, the speed of light, if it were just 4% larger or 4% smaller, carbon on earth wouldn't be stable, and life as we know it wouldn't exist. It's as if as if somebody perfectly tuned that so that we could have life on earth. I just have to ask the question, does that make sense by accident? Or is that the hand of God that created this place so that we could know it? And as I laid in my dorm room bed, thinking about that, pondering that, praying about that, I realized that I missed the second half of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1 1 said, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The second half is, says that by faith we understand that the universe was created at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And I found it fascinating that the author of Hebrews sort of intrinsically links faith and our understanding of the universe. Now the author of Hebrews didn't know anything about Maxwell's equations. The author of Hebrews didn't know, it, didn't know the equals mc squared. The author of Hebrews didn't even probably know that the earth was round. They didn't know anything about the sun. They didn't know how far it was away. They didn't know how much energy was in it. And yet the author of Hebrews knew that God expressed himself in the world around us. You know, it's interesting. uh, Ancient scholars actually thought that there were two Bibles. One was the written word of God, and the other was the universe around us. And they thought that you couldn't really know God by studying either one of those alone. They thought that if you really wanted to know God, you had to study his handiwork in creation and you had to study his written word. And sort of as I explored that, that's what I realized. I realized that I wanted faith and science, faith and technology in my life to get mixed up. I wanted my faith to be an inspiration for me to study science and go deeper, and I wanted science to be an inspiration and encouragement to my faith. And it totally changed the way I looked at things. It it sort of removed this uh, um, um, this sort of unneeded separation between the two. It's interesting, in, in, uh, in Romans 1, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says that for since the creation of the world, his, uh, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, having been clearly seen, being made understood from what has been made, so that all were without excuse. The Apostle Paul calls us to look into the world and see God's fundamental nature. And when you look And, you know, I think in today's world, now that we know so much more about science and physics, there's so much more we can find out about God. We can find out about God's desire for order and structure by looking at the elegance of these five equations that describe so much of the world around us. Now, you may not understand these five equations. That's okay. Um, Probably some of you do, some of you don't. But I think you can get a sense, uh, just even by looking at the stars, of the incredible grandeur and complexity the incredible power that exists in the universe. 
and the incredible simplicity of a God who designed math and connected it to physics so that we could explore it and understand it. It's almost like God sent us on this grand treasure hunt where he, he placed math and physics way down the line and then just sat back and waited for us to find it, to be able to experience him in understanding math and physics. Now, I want to tell you, uh, for those of you who work in technical fields, that it's hard. It's really tough to let science and faith get mixed up. It can feel like a huge risk to even go there. And I want to encourage you to try it because I think God is good and God wants us to be in that space. God wants us to be exploring that space. But I think it's tough. And I think for many of us, we see sort of our careers and our jobs as one thing and sort of our faith experience in church as another thing. And we oftentimes put those in silos and we we don't want to let them get mixed up. So I want to encourage you today that if you are in a technical field, I want to encourage you to let those get mixed up. If you're not in a technical field, you probably have a family member or a friend or a neighbor. And I would encourage you to encourage them to go there, to let their faith and their careers be interlinked. And so I want to invite you, uh, if, you are, if you are in a technical field, if you're a scientist or an engineer, if you're a mathematician or if you're in medicine, if you're a doctor or, or a nurse, I want to invite you to stand up and just we want to spend some time praying for you. And so what we'll do is I want to invite you just a second. We'll, we'll just have you stand up. If you're not in a technical field, I want to invite you to just put your hand out towards the people who are standing and send them a prayer of encouragement. If you're comfortable, you can go ahead and, and put your hand on them and encourage them to let their faith and science get mixed up. And as you pray, I would encourage you all to stop back and think about the incredible grandeur, the incredible beauty that God has given us here on this earth, the magnificence of this creation. Stop and think about that star, Deneb, and think about that 2,600-year path to your eye, how God created this for us to enjoy and to experience, to know his character. So with that, I'd just like to ask, if you're in a technical field, go ahead and stand up at this time. If you can be brave, stand up. And uh, if, you guys, if you guys can just reach out a hand to the people who are standing and feel free to just pray out loud. We'll just spend the next three minutes praying for the people who are standing. Go ahead and feel free to stand up and pray out loud. So to close, I just want to pray for us um, and enter in a time of celebration of what God has given us here on this earth and in this universe. So Father, we're just so thankful for the way you've displayed yourself here. We're so thankful for this incredible universe that you've built for us, God. I pray, God, that we can be the people who are willing to ask the hard questions, the people who are willing to explore what you've created, to to let our faith and our understanding of science and technology get mixed up. I pray, God, that that for our people here in Silicon Valley, where we're a culture obsessed with technology, God, that 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 obsession can cross over into faith, that we can see God in the the handiwork of our hands, whether we're, we're programming a computer or we're sitting in an office, God, that that the work of our hands and your Holy Spirit get mixed up, God. That they become one, that our, our, our life at work and our life at church uh, become intricately interrelated, God. I pray for the hard spots. I pray for the ways in which that's been hurtful and difficult in the past. I pray for the ways in which that feels too hard. Um, and I pray for healing in those places, God. God, I just pray uh, that we would understand in faith the beauty of your creation, and that would be an encouragement Uh, to see your incredible love for us as displayed in the way you've made this place around us, Lord. We just ask all these things in your name. Amen.